Hello. Thank you very much indeed for that uh, introduction. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to today's very short lecture. Um, this is just a snapshot of um, the, the sort of materials that we teach here at Rome Business School. Um, I thought I would highlight something that's really current at the moment, something that's incredibly um, important and increasingly so, but that not a lot of people know about. It's, it's very much a, a cutting edge part of digital marketing. Um, and that is mobile first web marketing. So I want to um, explain what I mean by that, but first I'm going to introduce myself um, just to give you my background and my bona fides. Um, I've been in marketing since 1993, which is 26 years ago. Um, I started in marketing when marketing didn't have a, an internet component. There was no web, there was no such thing as a browser. Um, but I also happened to be in the right place at the right time in 1996, only three years later, when the web arose. So I found myself doing digital marketing before digital marketing existed as a subject. And I've been doing that ever since. So that's 23 years um, at the coalface of digital marketing. Um, so my first job was for the world's first online trading portal, um, which put American retailers in touch with Chinese manufacturers. Since then, I've built and marketed literally hundreds of websites. Um, I've worked for large corporates, I've worked for small NGOs, um, private companies, I've run and uh, managed and created large, huge online platforms and portals for the British government. Uh, and currently I'm running online research communities for several large blue chip clients. Unfortunately, I can't reveal who they are for reasons of non-disclosure. Um, so that's me, that's my background. Um, I'm, I'm very, very familiar with this. Obviously, you can't know everything as a professor, but I do my best. Uh, to know a bit about everything. Um, so what I want to talk about to you guys today is um, mobile-first web marketing, the implication of the mobile browser and cell phone-based browsing uh, and devices on the subject of digital marketing. I am going to have to make a few assumptions here about your knowledge. Um, so I have, um, obviously, when, when this is a longer course, um, I will take you through more fundamentals, um, through the very, very basic building blocks of digital marketing. But let's assume that all of you um, are very, very familiar with the, the techniques that are coming at you. So as consumers and as browsers, um, you understand uh, what it is to be marketed to. So now let's look at it from, from the other side of the coin. But I'm going to assume you understand how a search engine works. I'm going to assume you understand what search marketing is, what banner advertising is, and so on because I simply don't have time to, to explain all of that. So with all of that taken into account, um, I'm gonna take you through a few uh, subjects. The first thing is to have a look at how much the, um, the use of mobile platforms has grown over, over the years. Um, and then I'm going to look at what implications that growth is having and has had on how we run websites. So in particular around web design um, and Moving on from that, there are some significant implications on search engine marketing. So in other words, um, you know, how it is that websites that we run uh, interact with Google in particular. So um, quite often I'm going to say search engine. Uh, when I say that, I mean Google. Um, at the moment, there's really no other significant player in the market. We have Bing, which is owned by Microsoft, but it doesn't really impact the statistics. So whenever I say search engine, I mean Google. And whenever I see, say Google, I mean search engine during this lecture. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to give you some practical advice on how to harness this new technology and how to make it work uh, in order, hopefully, to get first mover advantage and to try and beat your competition, try and get really, really high placement in Google organic search listings. Um, which is one of the most powerful and cost-effective ways of digital marketing that exists. Um, and then I'm going to conclude by just having a very, very brief look at what the implications of mobile browsers are on how we as marketers can advertise our products and services to mobile users. Um, and I have to admit that it's not a pretty story. Um, so those are, the, those are the five subject uh, topics that we're going to cover. Um, I'm going to try and conclude this within 20 minutes so that we have time for Q&A before I hand over to Biagio. So the first thing I want you to have a look at is this graph. Um, it is, uh, as you can see, it was compiled in 2016. Um, so that was 
coming up to two and a half years ago, um, clearly things will have moved on from here. But I want you just to have a look at, um, in the last 10 years, how much decline there has been in the use of desktops. So when I say desktop, I also mean laptop. In other words, a computer with a large, wide screen, um, the kind of thing that we used to find on every single desk. Um, we still find it on most desks, but in terms of personal use in particular, um, almost all of us are spending an inordinate amount of time clutching a mobile device um, as opposed to sitting down and looking at a screen and using a keyboard. Here you can see sometime in mid-2016, there was a point at which the, uh, the use of mobile devices crossed over with the use of desktops. In other words, mobile use plus tablets, so I'm talking uh, um, iPad here, as well as mobile phone, um, crossed over in around mid-2016. Now, obviously, this is just one um, form of statistics. Um, there are lots of other ways to measure this, and I'll, I'll show you another graph in a second, which is a different way of measuring it. Um, but all of the ways of gathering data tend to agree that it happened around 2016. Um, in particular, this, uh, I, I, I will give you a citation for this that you can look at at the end, um, Stat Counter, uh, they measured 250,000 websites and um, where, pe where uh, the different hits were coming from in terms of what devices were being used in terms of visits to the website. Okay, So that's, that's one way of measuring it. Another way of measuring it um, is by time, which I'll show you in a second. Now, these figures here are a bit more crunchy. These are um, figures taken from a website that I, in fact, own and I've set up. So these are real-world figures. Um, the previous graph there, this is aggregate, okay? This is an aggregate graph of 250,000 websites. Um, this is anecdotal, um, but you can see here, I, I got this data this morning from my Google Analytics uh, dashboard, and you can see um, that when I launched the site in 2014, um, the number of people coming on a mobile phone uh, was around 20%. Um, by the end of 2015, not just mobile plus tablet, but mobile itself, use had crossed the 50% mark. So by 2016, my website should already have been a mobile first platform. In fact, it wasn't. In fact, it's only become a mobile first platform in the last year. And the reason is that even though I'm uh, following this subject all the time, um, it's still quite easy uh, to forget how oriented the web now is to the use of mobile browsers. Moving on from here, here is another way of measuring how common uh, the use of mobile platforms is. And this is measured not in terms of visits or in terms of pages viewed on websites, but it's viewed in terms of number of minutes by individuals spent online. Um, I have, there's a PDF um, that I've linked to at the end of this uh, presentation. Um, it's from a company called Comscore, so they, I believe they're using their own software to measure this. Um, so obviously uh, the accuracy or otherwise needs to be uh, taken with that in mind. Having said that, we can see that um, in the USA we have 71% of minutes spent online are spent on uh, a mobile platform. Um, Canada, UK, Spain, uh, the Italian, uh, so the, the European countries are all fairly similar. But now on the bottom line, we, we're looking at um, a developing country like Indonesia, we have 91% of minutes spent online are spent using a mobile phone. Why is this? The answer is infrastructure, mainly. Um, in Indonesia, um, it is costly, both in terms of infrastructural development, because Indonesia is a large archipelago with hundreds and hundreds of islands. Um, but secondly, it's also costly in terms of personal expenditure for equipment to buy a desktop computer. Um, but it is a, a fraction of the price to access the web with, uh, with a mobile device. Which brings us on to my reasoning behind um, this enormous growth in minutes online and similarly uh, large but not quite so accelerated growth in terms of visits to websites. Um, the main thing is the rise of the 3G mobile network and the 4G and soon the 5G. 3G is about the speed of uh, copper wire that you might have coming in and out of your, your house. Uh, 4G is similar to the lower end of cable connections and 5G will be the, the top class um, why, uh, uh, sorry, fiber optic network that we will see um, rolling out in the next few years, but wirelessly attached to your, uh, to your computer. 
Um, we also have the proliferation of mobile devices as something that's seen as essential to life. So um, whereas, you know, 10 years ago, an iPhone was a luxury, um, now people feel they cannot live their life without some kind of mobile device, some kind of connection to the internet. And we get kind of worried when we're no longer connected. People go on retreats into forests and so on so that they can just be offline for a while. Um, there's also been an enormous growth in the uh, idea of Wi-Fi only locations. So by that I'm talking about countries like Indonesia, the Philippines, um, places like Mongolia, Sub-Saharan Africa, all of these places, it has until now been almost impossible to wire up remote locations with um, physical wires. But it is fairly easy just to drop a, uh, a cell phone tower on top of a hill, power it from a solar powered generator, and suddenly everybody in the surrounding area, 40, 50 kilometers radius, is online and they can get a mobile device, uh, particularly the, the, the kind of um, uh, low end Chinese devices for less than 100 US dollars and they can be online. Um, so in these areas we find a lot of um, the websites and also um, online applications and platforms like mobile banking is really leading the way um, in, in developing countries compared to the West where we're still relying on desktops and we're kind of complacent. Um, and then the final thing, this is part of a virtuous circle, which is going to be based on what I'm going to be talking about in the next few minutes, which is the increased usability of websites and apps. So previously, um, a lot of websites didn't even acknowledge that people would go onto them using a mobile device, which brings me to an exercise. So normally, during these lectures, I tell people to put their phones away. In this particular case, I want you to get your phone out. As long as you're not watching this exercise through your mobile device, I'd like you to open your browser and type in that domain name, morningstar.co.uk. And while I'm going through and talking through the next few slides, I want you just to try to find out on that web page where to log in. Imagine you have an account, where can you log in uh, to that particular website, okay? So I'm just going to leave that as a little um, diversion for you while I talk about the next few things. Um, and I'll be interested to get your report at the end uh, in the Q&A session. So how can we, as people who run websites, acknowledge and react to the vast growth in mobile platform devices? The answer is adaptive web pages. So what I mean by that are web pages that understand the size of the browser window that they are appearing in and change how they look depending on the size of that screen. Here's an example. So this again is Rome Vacation Tips, a site that I own and set up. And this is a screenshot taken from earlier on this day on my uh, widescreen laptop computer. And as you can see, there's a particular um, way of navigating this website, which is a horizontal menu bar, also known as tabs by some people, I call it a menu bar, running along the top. That's the part in purple. Um, and you can see there are various different subjects you can click through to skip the lines, roam with kids, tickets, transportation, etc. And I'll draw your attention too to three info boxes also arranged horizontally uh, underneath that menu bar. Now I'm going to show you what it looks like on a mobile platform. So that's taken uh, it's a screenshot from my, my Honor 10 uh, mobile phone. Now, this is exactly the same website, okay? There has been no change to the code. There's no change to the un underlying HTML or CSS, if you know what those things are. It's exactly the same website, but it's being viewed through a different size and shape screen. I will draw your attention again to how it's navigated. There is a blue, uh, there is a purple bar, but now we see a blue, three blue lines at the top. Now, I'm sure you're all very familiar with this. Um, this is a particular kind of mobile menu. Um, which is amusingly known as the hamburger menu. I also want to uh, draw your attention to how the info boxes are now, now laid out, whereas previously they were in a horizontal line, now they have rearranged themselves into a vertical line. Also the call to action buttons, they've stacked themselves up vertically. All of this is automated, it's all built into uh, the page design and built into the underlying code. There is a word for this, okay? I've called it adaptive here because that's what it does, but the word is responsive. It's responsive design. And that means web pages that adapt and change themselves based on the size of the screen. So they, not only do they rearrange the content, but they can also introduce new tools which are 
more friendly to mobile users, for example, the hamburger menu. Um, I don't know whether you know, but there's also another menu that's very, very familiar on mobile websites and apps, and that's three dots in a vertical line. Um, and out of interest, that's known in the trade as the meatball menu. Um, this concept was invented originally for a, for a website for Audi in 2001, which was a very, very long time ago. It wasn't perfect, but it was certainly the first iteration of a website that redesigned itself based on the, um, the size and shape of the screen. Um, the name responsive was coined by 2010. And again, in the further reading, um, you can go to have a look at one of the first ever responsive websites. It's still in existence and it still works very, very well. Um, there is another implication around the use of mobile phone in terms of design, and that is uh, e-commerce. Now, not everybody who markets online is trying to market in a transactional uh, business to consumer way, uh, but a lot of people do. And so I would imagine for most people who run websites and market companies digitally, um, they're going to want what is called a call to action. And that call to action quite often is the exchange of information. In other words, it's a, a prospect or a customer giving information to the marketer, either to buy something or to um, provide a, a lead, for example, for a salesperson to follow up. Um, you can see here that while nearly 60% of people are using mobile phones to look at products online, only 15% of people actually perform that transaction on their mobile device. They run away from the mobile devices and they jump onto the desktop in order to make the purchase. Why is that? The answer, is, well, there are several different answers, but the main, the main reason is that most mobile um, transaction platforms are incredibly user unfriendly. It's already problematic enough trying to type your name into an on-screen um, keyboard. It's already problematic enough trying to put in your, you know, your zip code and your, your address and then your credit card number and your expiry date, blah, 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 blah. People don't like doing it. The websites they're going to do not help at all. Um, and this is why this behavior uh, is so starkly different. Now, these stats were from 2015, so that's getting on for four years ago. Hopefully, things have improved a little bit. However, um, there is still... Uh, an implication here, so this, this stat here is from last year, 29% of smartphone, smartphone users will immediately switch to another site or app if it doesn't satisfy their needs. So there's an absolute need for people who run and design websites and are in charge of the user experience, which is almost always the digital marketing department, to ensure that their users are getting absolutely the best experience they can possibly get within the limitations of the platform they're using. Um, and finally, this, this other statistic, 84% of people have experienced difficulty completing a mobile transaction. So it is our job to make that experience better and therefore to get more money for our companies and our clients and more leads, more transactions and make more conversions. Okay, I hope you all had fun looking at morningstar.co.uk. Now I'd like you to go back to the same mobile browser and type in morningstar.com. So the first one was the UK uh, branch of the Morningstar company. Morningstar.com is the American one. Um, and I want you to uh, try to do the same thing, find out where to log in and have a look around that site and see how easy it is to browse. Um, and have a think about the implications of what you discover when you do that. Okay. So that is design. Those are, the, those are the fundamental implications of this revolution on what we as digital marketers need to do in terms of design. There's another implication, um, even more dramatic. This is uh, the implication uh, towards search engine marketing of the mobile revolution. And that, rather dramatically, is known as mobile geddon. Okay, so this is a, a crazy, um, highly over-exaggerated, uh, crunchy sort of headline that's been created by journalists. But there is a very serious implication for those of us who uh, rely on organic digital search engine marketing in order to further our marketing goals. Um, so just to explain what mobile data is or was, on April the 21st, 2015, Google changed its algorithm. 
the algorithm no longer uh, looked at a desktop site, indexed it, and then um, all the techniques that the digital marketers were using uh, carried on working. In April 2015, so just over four years ago, Google said, in fact, if a site is no longer friendly to mobile users, then it is not going to perform as well in the Google search organic search index as if it were um, working really, really well for people who are using a mobile phone browser. Mobile Geddon hasn't finished. So March 2018, Google announced on its blog that it would be rolling out mobile first indexing. So that's even more strong. Let me explain. There is a piece of software known as a search engine spider. It's owned by Google, this one. Each search engine has got its own spider. And this particular spider is called Googlebot. Very, very cute. And Googlebot's job is to go to every single web page online, or however many 11 billion there are, and read every single word on every single page and send all of that information back to Google's index. So until March last year, what Googlebot did was it pretended to be a desktop browser. So it would go to your website and it would lie to your website essentially and say, hi, I'm a, I'm a happy browser, please give me your website. It would receive the website and then it would read it all, index it all and send it back to Google index. Uh, however, no longer. Now what Googlebot does is it pretends to be a mobile phone. Uh, so it does what's called mobile first indexing. It has a look at the website as if it were a mobile phone. It indexes that and it sends that back to Google. Anything it finds that is not accessible to a mobile phone uh, is really given very, very low priority in Google's index. It does still read it, but it doesn't really care about it that much. Um, this is a massive, massive change. Now, the interesting thing is, and the vast majority of digital marketers have not yet acknowledged this, and they haven't yet started to roll out super mobile first websites in terms of content or in terms of design. Let me tell you now about a little problem. The problem with responsive pages, the ones that adapt themselves, is the same code. It gives you a one picture when you look at it with a desktop and another picture when you look at it with a mobile browser. It's very, very slow. Reason being, you need an enormous amount of code, thousands upon thousands of lines of code, in order to make this responsiveness work properly. Now that's fine if you're super fast fiber optic cable connection, uh, usually on a desktop computer, but what if you're out in the forest somewhere and you're, you're relying on a slow 3G network? It could take minutes for a, a web page of this kind to load in. Um, also, not every responsive designer is equal. Many responsive mobile designers are quite bad. Um, they don't give, they, they, they do something that reacts responsively, but the, the thought behind it uh, in terms of usability for mobile users is, is in fact not as, um, uh, it's not as thoughtful as many other designers. So the, the responsive experience for mobile, uh, mobile accessed websites is not so good in some cases. Um, all of this means these web pages are very, very slow to load and People get a poor experience anyway, even though it's differently manifested. So it's not poor experience like morningstar.co.uk was, but it's poor experience because they have to wait forever for the web page to load in. Um, and we are very, very short of attention these days. Uh, we're, we're online creatures, and if something doesn't load in within about five minutes, or five seconds, I mean, we hit the back button and we go and find something else. So if you're a digital marketer, it's absolutely vital that you're mobile web experience is instant and it's usable and it has a really, really accessible menu and it's very easy to navigate. So Google has acknowledged this problem. So Google is the one pushing for the mobile experience to be the most important thing there is. Um, Google has therefore sponsored a new technology and this technology is called AMP. AMP stands for accelerated mobile pages. Now I want you to recognize and remember that zigzag electric bolt there in a circle because uh, you will see after this lecture you're going to start seeing that and noticing it and now you're going to understand what it means. So what accelerated mobile pages is, is a project, it's open source meaning it has many many uh, contributors, it's um, 
contributed by thousands of people all over the world, and it's the code underlying it is open to all, and people can vote on it. Um, it is sponsored by Google, though. These kind of things cost money to run. They need servers and so on. So Google is sponsoring it because Google knows it will provide a better experience for the Google users. Um, it is only designed for mobile devices. You can look at AMP pages using a desktop, but they look kind of weird. Um, but that's fine. They look perfect on mobile devices. Um, the idea behind AMP is it strips out any unnecessary code. All it gives you is minimal HTML code plus some very, very small images to give you an attractive looking web page, but something that loads in incredibly quickly into your browser. So you don't have to worry and you don't have to wait. So if, you're, if you are a digital marketer, uh, having an AMP uh, version of your website is incredibly beneficial because you're giving not only uh, Google a good experience, you're also giving your users a good experience. They go to your website, they find the AMP page, and it loads in incredibly quickly. Finally, this is mere speculation. Nobody actually knows this stuff. Um, whenever anybody tells you anything about how Google works, it's always speculation, because Google has the mo ro most robust NDA in history, but it's speculated that Google actually boosts AMP results in its search engine results pages position. So if you use AMP, AMP is a Google-sponsored project. It stands to reason, kind of, that Google probably gives you a boost in uh, the search engine listings. So what do, how can you recognize an AMP page when you find it? Well, the first thing is it only, you only ever see AMP page results if you're using a mobile phone to Google something. So here, um, this is, again, Rome vacation tips. Um, if you type in how to skip the lines at the Vatican, you will see uh, a list of websites. Um, at the top, you'll see some sponsored um, ads, and then you'll see what are called the organic search listings here. Um, and of all of these search listings, there is one that you can see which has the little zigzag lightning bolt AMP. And that, in fact, is mine. That's because I run AMP on my website. Um, you only see them in Google results. The results, interestingly, are not actually stored on your website. I'll explain this a little bit more in the next slide. The results, the page underlying that uh, search result, in fact, is stored in Google's own memory. Um, when that list of search results is loaded into your mobile browser from Google, in fact, that AMP page is also loading in in the background behind that page. What that means is when you click that link, how do I skip the lines at the Vatican, it doesn't take any time at all to load in because it's already been loaded in. And that's because the amount of code involved is so tiny that Google can afford to just send the page together with the search results and then instantaneously reveal it the moment you click the link. Um, but Google still credits your site with a hit. It's not like you've lost anything even though the web page is stored on Google's own server. Uh, so how this works, imagine this is Googlebot, represented by the G. Googlebot is going to, how do I avoid the, avoid the lines of the Vatican page? And it discovers a responsive page. That responsive page looks the same to uh, a desktop computer as it does to a, a mobile device in terms of content. Um, in terms of design, it completely changes, but in terms of content, it looks the same. Um, but Google also asks for uh, the same domain, uh, the same URL, except with the letters AMP after it. You can see there in the link, how do I avoid the lines at the Vatican, slash AMP. Every time Googlebot accesses any web page online, it always asks for the AMP version. Nine times out of 10, maybe 99 times out of 100, it doesn't find one. If it does find one though, it then pulls that AMP page out and it sticks it in its own memory. The next time somebody finds, does a Google search that reveals an AMP page, that AMP page is not coming from the website anymore. It's coming from Google's own memory. That improves the, res the responsiveness of the page. It improves the experience that the user has, and it also ex improves the speed with which the, um, the page loads into your browser. So all in all, uh, it's highly beneficial for the user, and we believe in the industry that it also benefits how well your site performs in Google. And of course, that's almost priceless to have a good performing site. So how can we do all this? Well, I can't um, assume that you're all building websites all over the place, but let's, let's just mention a few uh, popular and famous technologies. Um, the first thing to understand is that when you design from now on, 
whenever you put a website together, the first thing you need to look at it in is a mobile browser. Now, the major, major tools that most people use, they have um, mobile browser emulators. So they have design tools that allow you to design as if for a mobile phone. Even if it's more convenient to do it on a desktop, you need to be able to look at it as though it was a mobile phone. Design for mobile first, and then look at it in the desktop and tweak it uh, according to that. And both Elementor and Divi allow you to make a slightly different version of each, um, each type of browser, so desktop or tablet or mobile. Um, there are uh, the new platforms Wix and Squarespace. Um, Wix also has a mobile first um, viewing tool. And then um, there are other platforms that are quite popular out there, which while they don't have mobile first viewing tools, they do guarantee a responsive template. So you're designing a website in a template that's been designed by somebody else and it is guaranteed to be responsive. And that's Squarespace and Shopify and Big Commerce. Of course, there are other content management systems out there, but those are the big six. Um, and well, uh, WordPress, sorry, the big five, including WordPress, um, and all of them claim at least to uh, have tools that help you design mobile first. I will say though, from personal experience, Elementor and WordPress is far and away the winner. It's so easy to use and very, very simple to view as if you're uh, a mobile user. And of course, it's not good enough just to test it in an emulator. You need to test it in the real world. Send it to your friends and family, test it with your phone yourself. Um, and Google provides various different testing sites that you can use in order to check that it's working properly. Um, these are free, they're free to access. I've included the links at the end of this uh, presentation. One is called PageSpeed. Um, that will tell you how long it takes to render your responsive code. Um, gives you a score out of 100. Um, I have had one site at 96. Um, Rome Vacation Tips, which performs well in Google, is around 32. Um, I'm hoping uh, I'm going to do something to it tomorrow to try and increase that speed. Because the faster your site responds, and the more mobile friendly your site is, the better it does in Google. And of course, that leads to more conversions and more sales. Um, there is also the Google Mobile Friendly tool, which will give you a, a, a traffic light score to say how well your site's doing in terms of mobile phone. Always use AMP. Now, the interesting thing about AMP is not everybody's using it. Very few people are using it. So therefore, you have an advantage. You can get in there before your competitors and beat them if you use AMP. So how can you implement AMP on your website? Well, if you're using WordPress, there's an AMP plugin. Um, very, very easy to use. It automatically generates AMP pages based on the content of your regular pages. You don't even have to think about it. It just does it. Um, there are other tools for other content management systems out there as well. Here's an example of Google's mobile friendly page. Um, it just gives you, a, in this case, a green light, but it's highlighted a few things that I could improve. Uh, page loading issues and a bunch of things usually to do with um, interactivity, JavaScript, how menus render and so on. Um, and then to change the problem with uh, e-commerce, Google has also got a wonderful site called thinkwithgoogle.com, which gives you a large amount of information on how to improve the user experience in terms of e-commerce. But of course, we can learn from this in all sorts of ways. So if you're trying to create a contact form to generate leads, etc., cetera, um, Google will give you a large amount of very, very good advice about uh, usability and about how to create a frictionless experience so that you're not placing barriers in between your prospect and converting them into a lead or converting them into a sale. Okay, how am I doing? Okay, I've, I've gone on five minutes, maybe too long. I do apologize. Um, final thing I want to say in the last two slides. Um, first of all, where does this leave uh, mobile advertising? In other words, paid advertising, paid marketing. Um, what it says here, mobile advertising will drive 75% of all ad spend in 2018. That's Forbes, so that's a fairly um, reputable source. Um, how is it going to happen? Well, I just want to say from personal experience, and I'm sure we all agree as consumers, most mobile advertising is awful. Like it's absolutely terrible. It's really annoying. It manifests itself first primarily as banner advertising, video advertising, videos that you can't skip, you can't pause, you can't mute, um, that shriek while you're on the bus. Um, mobile search advertising, those, so that's pretty much the same as what we see in Google search results on a desktop. And then finally, social media mobile advertising. I just want to talk about each one of these for a couple of seconds. Banner and video advertising is a failure, in my opinion. Most clicks on these things are accidental clicks. Um, unskippable pop-ups that you can't get rid of. 
uh, before you get to the content of a page, they are counterproductive. They might generate a lot of clicks, but I don't think they generate a lot of conversions. Um, I really, really don't like them. I think if you're spending money on doing these things, you're probably wasting that money. In terms of mobile search advertising, um, it's very cost effective, it's very, very effective, and it works very well. It doesn't really differ from uh, how it works on the desktop. You make some Google ads using AdWords, and they arrive in Google search results based on your keywords that you've bid for, the same way as on desktop. Um, they're not too intrusive, they're fine. I think that's a, a reasonable way of under, uh, undertaking mobile advertising. Finally, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, social videos, all that kind of stuff. Social media, mobile marketing. Now, this is the interesting part of this slide. Advertisers pay social media, and social media does the mobile advertising work for them. If you're an advertiser, you just pay Facebook, and Facebook will handle it for you. You don't have to worry about it. People are habituated to using the Facebook app and the Messenger app, Instagram app, uh, or Facebook on the mobile browser. They see the ads all the time. They think of it as something that Facebook is uh, pr providing to them, rather than necessarily getting annoyed with the, um, with the advertiser. Plus, Facebook is constantly um, refining how these ads appear and how they work. So all you have to do is to give your money to these platforms, uh, however trustworthy they are or not, let's not get into that argument, um, and spend your lump sum on Facebook, um, and you're doing mobile advertising without even thinking about it. It just happens. So that's been a very, very brief whistle-stop tour through this very exciting subject. Um, it's something that if you're a digital marketer, if you want to get into this subject, you need to be very, very uh, aware of because this is being neglected at the moment. But as you can see, it's been something that's been incredibly important for the last three years at least, if not longer. Um, here is a bunch of extra reading. These are all incredibly interesting articles um, and statistics and so on. And I, I hope you really uh, enjoy um, having a look at them. So um, I've spoken for too long, so I've only got time for two. I'm just going to invite two questions now. Um, so let me just have a quick look um, at some of the questions that we have lined up. Um, so here, um, Harry Sims has asked a very interesting question. He said, in your opinion, how can we best optimize our content for organic traffic? Should we optimize it for mobile devices first? Well, actually, I think you asked that question before I, uh, I ended up answering it anyway. Yes, um, we need to view as mobile. And in fact, there, is, um, you know, there are tools out there which say uh, you can view um, uh, as Googlebot. So you can see your website as Googlebot sees it. That's available within the Google Search Console. Um, and Googlebot, of course, is doing uh, its job as a mobile-first indexer. Um, from Richard, uh, should we optimize our marketing campaigns for mobile since decision-making happens mostly on mobile devices? Yeah, um, we need to look at that. Do you remember back to that um, slide which showed the, um, the decision-making happening on the mobile, but then the transaction happening on a desktop. I think that's still with us. So yes, the marketing and the way we speak to people and the way we create the copy, the way we write the advertising copy, that really, really needs to be concentrated around mobile. Where it comes to the actual transaction, we need to optimize it as much as we possibly can in terms of the, um, uh, the user experience. Um, however, we need to bear in mind that that transaction is probably still going to happen on desktop, at least for the next two or three, uh, two or three years, anyway. Okay, so I'm sorry I didn't have a chance to get through, get to all of your questions, um, but uh, I have overrun a little bit. I got too enthusiastic about the subject. So without further ado, I'm now going to hand over to Biagio. I'm going to say thank you very much indeed for your time. It's been a pleasure. Um, I hope you found that useful, and I'm sure there are going to be some other um, questions that you may have, and perhaps Biagio can forward them on to me, um, and I can give you a written answer. So thank you very much indeed, and good evening. Thank you, thank you very much, James. It was a pleasure to, to hear these tips from, uh, from your experience and a very interesting lecture. So now we go to uh, Biagio Cianese. Um, Rome Business School's marketing director, who will give us a little bit more details on the programs that Rome Business School can offer to uh, to, to prospective students from all over the world. Uh, Biagio, you're on. 
yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Diraz. Thank you very much for being with us. And um, thank you very much, Jim, to Professor Jim Whittle. Um, so let's move on. This is Rome Business School. Um, we are actually live from Rome here in Rome Business School. We are in the center of Rome. Um, I'm prepared for you a brief introduction to the school, to our program, and then we will have the time to chat about our program, the admission process, how to come uh, to study uh, with us in uh, Rome. So Rome Business School is an international business school. We are based in Rome, but basically at, um, in the rest of the world through online education and through some international branches. Um, basically, our main role is to give you, yes, academic uh, education, but also to close the gap between the school and the job market. This is why, as you will see uh, further in the presentation, one of our uh, main feature of our program is the career services and guaranteed internship program, which is very interested, interesting. If you would like to know more about our internship program, especially Europe, Dubai, USA internship program, stay with us. We will talk about it later. Let's talk about accreditation. These are briefly our main accreditation. All our masters are accredited by a university. That means that from uh, roughly two years now, our master, not only our professional master ideal for the job market, but also academic masters that entitled the student with 60 ACTS, International University Graded System and a double certificate, one from Rome Business School, one from VIEW, which is our academic partner, Valencia International University. This is um, a representation of our student body. Basically, our students are coming from everywhere. Uh, we had, in the last intake, students from 152 countries, which is basically a record, um, we are probably the most international business school in Europe at the moment. And this is also because we have online program. Our online program are live in full audio video interaction exactly as we are live right now. And this is one of the main features as well of our program, as well as the international staff. We am Italian. so. Uh, I, mm, I represent Italy in the staff, but we have basically um, staff members coming from Australia, Albania, Africa, everywhere. These are our program, our master's degree from core business program, inter, uh, traditional program in a business school, such as the MBA, Marketing and Communication, Human Resources Management, you can see that we have very peculiar and specific master's degree. Arts and culture, food and beverage, fashion management, and tourist management, for example, are very related to made in Italy. They all guarantee you an internship, but we also have some very specific topic, such as political marketing, agribusiness management, and um, sports and lifestyle management. This is the, the latest of our program, the newest of our program, and the master in e-health and telemedicine management. Um, I would like to keep this slide on for a few minutes. Um, all our program, you can attend them online or on campus. Some of these program are full-time, uh, meaning marketing and human resources. The rest of them are part-time, but basically you can choose to follow them in Rome or at your studio, at your home, wherever you are. You can follow a master's degree online. You can graduate by staying online. Basically, you uh, don't have to come to Italy whatsoever. Of course, it's a different experience. Coming to Italy, it's an amazing experience for, you know, studying abroad and deciding that uh, Italy as a destination, it's itself, it's very, in itself, it's very exciting as an experience. 
but I would like for you to know that we have maximum flexibility in terms of attendance mode. The most flexible of this program is the MBA, a Master's of Business Administration. Why? Because for all the masters, we have fixed intake. For example, our next intake is going to be October 2019. You can start our master in October 2019. For the MBA, you can start whenever you want. The MBA is a modular structure. We have one module each month, and you can basically design, decide when to start and finish in one year. So this is another amazing opportunity by Rome Business School, and this is a very unique feature by our MBA. Um, main feature, I would like to focus on tutoring. Each class got a tutor. Uh, international internship, our full-time program guarantee you an internship in Dubai or USA, didactic, didactic of excellence, not only professors, but speakers willing to bring them experience CEO from company, HR manager from companies, marketing manager, exactly as you just had uh, the possibility to witness through um, Jim Wittow uh, lecture about mobile marketing. Jim is a professor at Rome Business School, um, and it's not, you know, the traditional professor, it's not so academic. Uh, in fact, our students love uh, Jim Wittow. Uh, because it brings experience to the classroom. Flexible learning options, as I told you, online, weekend, part-time, it's up to you. Career services, we will talk about it later in detail, but it's amazing. Basically, you have the support of career experts, optimizing your CV, your cover letter, uh, finding the right opportunity in the job market for you, multicultural environment not only Rome Business School, learn from your classmates because they come from 152 different countries. These are the flexible learning options I was talking about. This slide is to show you that they them all bring to the same certification, master's degree with 60 ACTS, no matter if you do it on campus, online, or third option, blended which means that you can decide what part of the master you want to take on campus and which part of the master you want to take online. This is the platform that we use for live lecture because all our lectures are live and you will be able to interact with your mic and your cam with the professors. And these are our main uh, didactic techniques. I would like to highlight something our master is, um, duration is one year, six months of lectures and six months of final project work. Final project work is very practical. It could be related to your internship, but throughout your year, you will also have Italian language courses, company visits to our partner, to our company partner, uh, study tour to social and cultural learning, seminar, workshop, we value not only the lecture in the classroom, but also the group discussions, the experience, and of course, personal development. This is the career services, what they do. Basically, they review and edit your CV. Then they insert the CV in the Rome Business School database and distribute it to companies, organization, and head hunters so that you can find the right opportunity for you. And when you find it, they support you in managing job interviews with coaching session. You have individual meeting with career services, group meeting with HR expert, and you can also book coaching session, career coaching session. For example, the first session is from um, is paid by Rome Business School, you can try, and then you can decide whether to do coaching sessions or not. All these services are included in our masters. We don't require your money for books, uh, CV optimization, internship, job opportunities, posting, no, absolutely. Everything is included in tuition fee. And I would like to, this to be very clear because Rome Business School value career services 
so much. This is very important to us. Our main goal is to make you work, basically, to close the gap between our school and the job market. In fact, we have a placement rate of 96%. 96% of our students find a job, internship, or start their own business within six months of completion of the program. This is our guaranteed internship program, Dubai, USA, Europe. You choose your destination if you study um, full time. And if you study part time, you still have the possibility to have your internship all around the world. Uh, the difference is that for full time students, the internship is guaranteed. For part time students, the career services is guaranteed. So there's a slight difference, but as I told you, 96% of our students are able to find an internship or a possibility to work after a master. These are some examples for you. Fowl, McDonald's, Unilever. These are, of course, our students from our course, uh, I think. Okay, sorry, I had a problem with the slides. World Food Program, Tata, it's a very important um, company in the automobile. Costa Crociere, DHL, Oxfam, some of the companies that work with us. Admission require, requirements are very, very uh, brief so that we can ask, uh, so that you can ask some question. Bachelor degree, basically you have to demonstrate English proficiency in selection interview and two years of professional experience for the MBA. Lab admission process, CV and cover letter evaluation, you schedule a selection interview, you wait for the committee decision and then you have the um, acceptance letter. After that, it's up to you whether to decide to study with us or not. We also have scholarship, up to 20% reduction of tuition fee by scholarship, an additional 10% discount based on tuition payment method. Basically, you can pay in installments or in one lump sum that entitles you to a discount, of course. These are some of the company involved in Rome Business School. As I told you, they are major company, small startup. Uh, they all work with us. They all work with um, our students. They all offer our students internships. These are our content. Um, you can contact us by email, by, um, by, by phone, or you can come to our website, romebusinessschool.com, and ask some question. Speaking of question, let me see if we have any. Okay, Diraj, I'm ready if you have any question. Okay, um, thank you very much, Diraj, for your uh, presentation. You're welcome. I am forwarding you one question that we received already, so it should appear on your screen. And we would be expecting more questions from the attendees. So you can ask your questions and using the chat box. There is a question mark if you're using a mobile phone. Uh, when oh. you click on the question mark, you can ask your questions there. You can type in the questions there and they will appear on our screen here to convey to Viaggio. Okay, I can see the first question, very interesting. Nurlan is asking, hi, does your school have scholarship that covers tuition fee accommodation, including living expenses and airfare? So, um, our scholarship covers tuition fee. Now, let's see what tuition fee uh, covers. Basically, everything except for accommodation and living expenses. Uh, all the rest of the features of the program books, career services, lectures, company visits, everything that is related to that, you don't have to pay, basically. You just pay your third attempt at your test. If you fail your test uh, twice and you have to repeat it the third time, there's a fee for that. Um, how can I choose an internship, Ara? And also, I dog is it. Essin is asking, could you explain more of the internship program? How long is it and what support do you provide? All the support that you need, guys. We have a department. Basically, this is how it works. When you study with us and you enter a program with a guaranteed internship, 
for example, let's say food and beverage or tourist management or marketing and communication, HR management, what is the process? You meet our career experts in an individual meeting. Then you have group meeting, then you get to know them better. They optimize your CV, they give you advices, and then they give you job um, opportunities and internship opportunities. This is how it works, basically. For the full-time students, you get to decide whether to uh, go and do your internship in Dubai, in the United States of America. We have several destinations in the United States of America or in Europe. Please feel free to go on our website. At the top um, of the screen, there's a button that says request information. Go there, fill the form, and we will ask all your questions in details. Could you explain what RBS looks in for a candidate, Harry? Hi, Harry. What are we looking for a, in a candidate? First of all, you have to match our requirement. At least a three-year bachelor degree, English proficiency, and then we evaluate motivation. Why do you want to do this master? Also, we evaluate your CV, what kind of experience you have, how proactive you are, and how willing you are to start your experience. A master is not only about the lectures, it's also about the whole experience, studying and living abroad, sharing everything with your classroom. It's something that we really, really value. And then we also value, um, of course, your uh, study, but we don't discriminate according to your background. So you can decide to change your career path. Maybe you never studied HR, but now you want to do it. It's fine to us. We don't discriminate based on age or background. What is the most important part in my application for you? What do you value most? Well, first of all, um, try to present yourself in, best, in the best way possible. Um, a really um, good CV makes the difference. Of course, when you apply, we ask you for your personal data and we ask you for the CV. And we, we, we would really like to see a good CV. Um, what is a good CV? A good CV contains the main information. It's also readable, easy to read, easy to understand what you've done. Sometimes CV are so messy and uh, too many graphics or picture or too many things because I understand that you would like to show all the things that you've done. Keep it minimal, keep it simple, keep it readable. This is very important. Um, about the requirements of bachelor degree, hi Zeho, we don't have bachelor degree. At the moment, we only offer higher education, only offer master's degree. We don't offer a bachelor degree. Uh, if you're asking for the master's degree, our main requirement is at least a three-year bachelor degree and English proficiency. Now, let me clarify that we don't ask for any certification when it comes to English proficiency. You have to demonstrate it during your selection interview because when you send your CV, you um, basically will be invited to, if you pass the first um, selection, which is based on the CV, um, we will uh, basically invite you for an interview. So we will test your English during the interview. Do you require tests and which? No. Era Karin, thank you very much for your question. No, we don't. Uh, we test, uh, in quotation mark, our candidate during a one hour selection interview. Our admission specialist will ask you about your background, will ask some question about you and your um, uh, professional aspiration. How big are your classes in terms? Hi, Mila. Thank you very much for joining us and thank you very much for your question. Uh, we tend to have maximum 15, uh, 15 um, to 20 students. Um, maximum, but it depends on the class. For example, the MBA has a very specific target, so we tend to keep it um, with very, very, just a few students, maximum five. 
for classes. There are some classes that are, uh, of course, uh, with more students, like 20 per intake, for example, arts and culture, fashion, sports, tourism. Uh, they are the most requested uh, program and we also value the fact that when you study with us you have to interact with your classmates um, and it's amazing if you happen to study in Rome Business School you will see that you will meet so many friends from uh, all over the, the world in this regard please go and visit our social media we post uh, success stories every week um, and you will see how many students take part in internship um, all around the world in Europe and how many nationality we host at Rome Business School. And uh, that's it for now. Please let me just uh, tell you briefly again, if you have any other question or if you need any information, just go on our website, www.romebusinessschool.com and you will have the opportunity to ask question we will answer in 24 hours so you all you have to do is request information button on the top of your screen on our website and we will answer in 24 uh, hours um, deadlines another question straight by the way uh, I was about to close the webinar you're right deadlines um, basically we don't have deadlines because we enroll people every year for two intakes because we have two intakes each year March and October so if you would like to enroll for October I suggest you to do your admission request as soon as possible we tend to close uh, at the end of September the enrollment for October but of course you will be still able to enroll for the March intake uh, to be more precise about the deadline, um, we communicate our, de de our deadlines to all our applicants when we're closing them. But in to, just for you to have the big picture, we enroll people ev um, every day uh, for the two intakes, so that you don't, if you don't have the possibility to study with us in October, you can come from March. Also, deadlines is a very sensitive topic at Rome Business School because if you're not in, on time to come to study with us in Rome for October, you can choose the blended formula, start your course online, and then come on campus for the second part of your master. Do you have open days so that I can meet someone from the admission team? Unfortunately, not in the near future, but we can come, you can come and um, take an appointment, visit the school and meet the staff when you want we have some specific days for cultural bazaar welcome parties and winter party these are three main appointments for a student and we um, welcome also prospective students applicants that wants to see the atmosphere everyone business school so vanya ivanova thank you for your question feel free to book your appointment and come and meet us in person this is not a problem not at all also, if you happen to be in Rome and you want, I don't know, uh, to test your English to, or to test the school, come and take a test lecture. You will be a, a Rome Business School student for one day. You're welcome to do so. It's not a problem. Absolutely, we are in the center of Rome. Okay, perfect. So um, I thank you very much for being with us. Uh, thank again to Professor Jim Whittle for the lecture. And I really hope to see you all again here in Rome. Um, again, feel free to ask any question to our email or go on our website, click the um, ask for information button and we will answer in 24 hours. Thank you very much, Diraj. That will be all from my side.